we're going to go into the main topic. So, Luke, I think the floor is yours. Uh, we do if you have anything or questions. I think we were trying to use the stage to make it easier for folks remote to be able to have kind of the space because it's always a little bit harder if there's conversations in room for folks remotely to be able to do it. So in the, the spirit of enablement and inclusion, just, I guess, ping or drop off the mic and I'll probably see the icon drop or say something in the text chat. And that way I'll work, be able to work you into like a space in the, uh, the presentation. That way there's room for you to have a question, not feel like you're looking for that opportunity. Thanks, Eric. And for everyone remote, this is Luke Tech. I'll be um, talking about travel security. This is, um, I wouldn't say near and dear to my heart, but it's based on an incident that occurred. And and I started talking to um, to some folks about it, and they encouraged me to have a talk about this. And, and here we are. Um, I do ask Eric to ping me in case there's a question. My speaking style is normally to pause during uh, during the talk to take a sip and and give someone else an opportunity to to key up and ask a question. So we'll do that and then we'll have some Q and A at the end. Um, also, Eric, poke me if I start to ramble because um, I did my best to prepare um, for this. I put in maybe 300 hours of prep time to to make sure that this talk was on point and informative. Um, so as we spoke, sorry, did you have something? I was going to say is that like 300 divided by I. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to say I put in some decent time. It's I'm not winging it, so I, I definitely went through this. Um, as I went through the intro, I'm a penetration tester by trade, a father and husband outside of work. Um, I'm a recovering perfectionist, and I'm really happy with the setup of our projector, except that it's leaking off the sides of the of the screen we have here, and I'm just truly upset about this, but hopefully I'll get over it. And I'm really passionate about security, and I want to share it with whoever wants to listen to it. And that's one of the drivers of having this talk. I was so passionate about an incident that occurred that I couldn't just sit back and, and not say anything. It's, it's one of those things that I'm not really an activist, but I just had to, um, I had to say something. And the reason I had to say something is this is a master key to a hotel. This master key opens every guest room door in this hotel. I had this in my possession. That's not the end of the story, though. It's because 40 other guests down the hall that I saw, uh, along with who knows where else in that hotel, also had one of these. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But talking about travel security, I just wanted to mainly touch upon a few points. Uh, what to think about when traveling. I travel maybe once a month or so. Um, at the end of the year, around December, a little bit more than that. And, and I hope to share some wisdom and maybe pick up some, some tips and tricks from others on um, making it more safe and more private for, for all of us. When, when I use the word security, I imply both security and privacy throughout this talk. Much of the notes that you'll see here are generally keyed for security, but think privacy as well, uh, to a certain extent, um, as, as much as possible. And we'll talk about where, um, where privacy doesn't exist in parts of security, um, starting with uh, simply beginning the, the uh, process of traveling. If you're going to travel by air, there unfortunately is no privacy. You're going to have to give out information, your name, address, and, and, and other info, because if you don't, the TSA will not invite you into their facility, known as the airport. So unfortunately, that's, um, that's one of the, the things we can't avoid. Um, other things, they may have some private information that I would hope that people assume are the boarding passes that were handed out. Uh, even though most of those boarding passes now are virtual on our phones, if you ever stand in a uh, an airport check-in line, I would say 95 to 99 percent of the people are using their phone as their boarding pass rather than paper. But they still use paper. I had a seat change recently, and they printed me a paper boarding pass, and of course the boarding pass on my app updated within minutes of that. But you'll still see the paper. The reason I bring that paper up is there were some stories back in the day where people were were scanning or taking photos of those boarding passes, and they were posting them on social media. Now, I don't think there's too much um, sensitive information on boarding passes other than maybe your name and, and flight times. But if you're posting that to social media and sharing that information out, an evildoer could potentially put one and one together and see, hey, you're not at home, and you're not at home during these days. So 
there's that. You kind of leave your door open, uh, figuratively and literally, at your home if, if an evildoer or somebody who's up to no good knows that you're traveling. So my recommendation would be to avoid posting that, that information. We'll, we'll get to more of those, um, those tips um, as we progress through this. When, when you book travel, of course, you have to give out plenty of information, such as your frequent traveler numbers, um, loyalty program and such. You, you bet your dollar that they're collecting that information on you and they're going to use it to potentially market other products to you, other services. They're going to sell something to you and, um, and they're going to use that information to sell to other marketers. That's something that we unfortunately can't, um, can't generally protect ourselves from. So I don't have too much, um, too much info on protecting yourself from that. But just know that you are giving plenty of information out, uh, not only when you book with a carrier such as a hotel or an airline, but also when you use their website or when you use their apps. Those websites, of course, will um, collect analytics, drop some cookies on your browser and, and what have you. Again, this is um, unfortunately part of the, the, the daily grind of, of traveling. One thing about the, the app analytics, I don't have a bullet point for this. But when you're using apps for, for booking travel, and you'll see this come up several times throughout this talk about um, the apps used for uh, airlines, for hotels, for ride shares, for wherever you're going, whatever you're doing out there. When those apps are running on your phone, they're often asking for your location information. And I don't know how Android is these days. I, I switched to iOS a couple years ago. But I know in iOS, it allows you to limit tracking to um, when you're only using the app. And that's something that wasn't um, in existence back in the day. Uh, that's one of the things. Also on Android, I know that the apps can collect a lot more analytics about the phone than iOS, I believe, unless this has changed since, since I've left that ecosystem. Essentially, the app can read what other apps you have running, uh, basics about the system, uh, your location. Of course, if you turn that on, your IP address and, and so on. So in, in my opinion, if you can limit your app usage, that's probably going to be the best in the long run. Diving into the, the first, you could say the first third of this, are there any questions yet uh, that we can quickly answer? See something happening there. Okay. And then in the chat, we just had some uh, folks raise up. Uh, Climber posted that Crest wrote a good article on the private information on boarding passes. So don't just throw it away. And then I posted a link kind of, you know, after the meeting. Uh, but Darknet Diaries did an awesome podcast covering, uh, it's called Jet Setters. And it was specifically someone who did just that. And they posted a ticket up on Instagram and went some wild places because of it. Oops. Yep. And yes, thank you, Climber, for the use of your photo of your jet. Appreciate that. Um, so, of course, when you book travel, we all travel first class, I assume, and this is generally what So there's that. Uh, in, in my opinion, a lot of this is opinionated. Some of it is fact. I'll kind of I'll try to preface that with what my opinion is and what is fact. My opinion is that physical security at airports is is very solid. Uh, it's probably one of the few facilities that a civilian, non-military individual will ever enter that level of, of security. That and possibly a, um, a maternity ward at a hospital. Those are typically really, really high security. So generally, it's unlikely that your physical safety is going to be harmed in an airport. But you're also in a really crowded area. And in any crowded area, situational awareness is a must. These days, ever since 9-11, um, anyone off the street can't just walk in and, and walk out to the terminal area and just watch planes and watch people. Back in the day, they could. When they could, they would look out for um, opportunities, opportunities where somebody had left their luggage laying around. They can swoop in and pick it up or left a laptop laying around. I'm not sure if anybody would want a laptop from the 90s, but... You know, there's there's a possibility. These days, it's it's much more solid, and in my opinion, better for the average traveler because it's less likely that you're going to have an evildoer just hanging out in the airport who isn't actually traveling themselves. Now, of course, not every traveler is is honest and, and 
on par with, with what they should be doing. So that situational awareness is um, something that I suggest keeping in mind, uh, just keeping your, um, your bags close, your information close when you have your laptop open and you think you have something um, uh, secure on screen, use a privacy filter. If you can't use a privacy filter, there's always ways to position yourself in an airport where there isn't somebody behind you, such as with a wall behind you or, or somewhere facing the crowd rather than facing away from the crowd, just to keep your stuff private. Um, phones also have security filters if you choose to go that route. Uh, facial recognition is something that we haven't seen much in the news lately. I can confirm one place, and that's Lowe's Hardware Store. It uses facial recognition. When you walk into their stores, they will run you through an algorithm, and they know who you are when you walk in there. Most, um, most of the public, I don't think, realizes that. Um, there's a high potential that other large retailers, such as Walmart or Target, uh, will do the same thing. Uh, chances are really, really good that when you're in an airport, they're also doing that. If you've ever been in an airport, it's second to uh, casinos in terms of camera count. They are certainly keeping an eye on things. And, and normally we think of those cameras as, um, as somebody in a control room watching out for these things. Oftentimes they're only used after, after the fact. They're simply there recording and, and collecting that information. So when you walk through an airport, your face is on a camera somewhere for better or worse. Hopefully, the facial recognition doesn't fail you. And unfortunately, if you happen to be a minority, um, potentially you're going to be misidentified because the algorithms that run these facial recognition systems are often not tuned to someone who is not white or male, unfortunately. I, I don't have a, a better explanation for that other than uh, if, if you're in the right place at the right time, let's say the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, you might be um, misrepresented or you might be asked to step aside and, and prove your case if one of those systems has unfortunately um, falsely identified you for something. As far as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, notice that there's, there's two things to think about. The Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on your device is slightly different than public Wi-Fi that you might connect to. Um, for those who may not be aware, when you connect to a Wi-Fi network and then you disconnect from it, if you told your computer or device to remember that network, it's going to try to look for that beacon or that network all the time, wherever you go. So if at one time you connected to Starbucks and you're sitting in this room, then your phone is still looking for that Starbucks network or your home network or that hotel network or whatever network. And the issue with that could be that those, um, <laughs> those signals are out in the public. Those, those type of beacon signals are not encrypted. So with the proper equipment, I could sit here and look at everybody's phone to see where they've been. And that could potentially lead to some issues if someone knows where you've been. And knowing where you've been is somewhat easy to connect with a service like, um, like Weigel, I think that's how you pronounce it, who, um, who generally builds a giant database of all Wi-Fi networks in existence. And you can essentially search for a network name. And if it's very unique, you might find it. And you might find that um, somebody's phone or device, uh, laptop or, or tablet, has connected to a questionable wireless network somewhere where they shouldn't have been. And that could be a, a connection back to somebody's track location. Um, so the recommendation when, when traveling, if at all possible, is to disable Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on your devices unless you are connecting to to a network specifically. So if you're just sitting there idle, turn off the Wi-Fi uh, if possible. On mobile devices, on laptops, turn off or disable the remembered networks so that they're not, um, they're not in storage or in memory and the operating system won't try to constantly connect to those networks. Uh, avoiding public Wi-Fi is pretty obvious. I don't think I wanna to spend too much time on that, but if you do use Wi-Fi, uh, public Wi-Fi, definitely use a VPN. Uh, know that that might be problematic if you try to use a VPN on an aircraft. Uh, I've never been too lucky with, with Wi-Fi on an aircraft. It just seems really flaky and, and inconsistent. Um, I know that SpaceX, not SpaceX, the Starlink, just received um, FCC approval to provide mobile Wi-Fi connectivity. That includes aircraft mobile. So maybe the Wi-Fi situation will improve on aircraft. No matter that, uh, using a VPN when you travel is, is good practice. And this also extends to hotels. Um, I have a, 
a device called a data blocker. So if you're in this room, you can you can see it. It looks like a USB stick, and it has a male and female end on both sides. So what this does is it plugs into a charger, such as a charger that you don't own, maybe one at a hotel or an airport, and then you plug your phone into um, this device along with the cable to charge it. Uh, I remember hearing stories way back in the day about rogue chargers. And I don't know if it's really a big deal these days because I know if I plug my phone into any sort of a computer or other device, it's going to ask for my approval to allow it to connect. So I think the security of mobile devices has increased to the point where, where these data blockers are probably moot, but I personally don't like to plug into any charger. And if I do, I'll use that device, um, but I prefer to just carry my own battery or or my own charger, along with um, with um, with the apps that could be in play here are the airline apps. When when I mentioned earlier that um, most boarding passes are stored on those airline apps, uh, there's no telling how much um, uh, location information or other analytical information that those apps are collecting. Uh, sometimes you don't know what it's doing in the back in the background. So my recommendation is to um, Enable only enable the location only when you're using the app and disable background data. So when you close the app, it's really closed, and it isn't trying to connect to services when when you're not actively using it. Um, the last point on this page is the AirTag tracking. I personally don't have too much uh, experience with AirTags, but I know that it has quickly become a privacy issue for for Apple. I think. Um, I think they handled it as well as they could have, but maybe they, they jumped the gun on putting these devices out because there have been plenty of stories so far where plenty of people have been followed by people that shouldn't be following them uh, with these trackers. On the other hand, it could potentially help you find your luggage. Uh, that's, that's a difficult um, proposition to say that you shouldn't use AirTags, but there's no telling who may have placed an AirTag on your person or in your luggage or in your possession that you may not know about. The benefit of that is that most iOS devices, uh, most phones, as if they're fully updated to the latest iOS, um, will let you know that you're being tracked or you're being followed by an AirTag. It'll see that same AirTag show up as you change locations, and it's going to let you know if it isn't um, connected to your phone. So either somebody is following you with an AirTag on them, or you have an AirTag on yourself. That could help you identify that. If you're using an Android device, the, the notifications are a little less um, uh, less available because Android doesn't use um, the AirTag ecosystem. Um, I don't know what, what recommendation I have about the AirTag tracking. Uh, if, if you use an Android device and, and, um, and you're traveling and you don't know if you have an AirTag on your person or in your luggage, it's probably a good idea to dig through your luggage as best as you can, check every pocket, check every fold, check every um, nook and cranny that you can, just to make sure that nobody um, has uh, placed these devices on your, um, on your person or in your things. I'm about ready to move on to the next section, which is public transit. I'll pause here for any questions. I wouldn't say a question, but uh, another consideration for physical security border agents in the United States have got like unlimited authority from at the border about 100 miles in or so. So if you, um, if you want the privacy, then you might consider using burner devices because you have to let them in. You, you might not have to give them the password, but you have to log in. Huh? I was trying to copy something. Absolutely agreed with that. Um, and hopefully those who are remote can can hear that that comment. Uh, I'll just repeat it in brief. Uh, the comment was that Border Patrol and Border Security have the legal authority to search your devices. What wasn't mentioned is the, the fuzzy nature of where the border really ends. A lot of the government thinks that the border ends at an international airport. So if you think about international airports, we happen to have one in Greenville. That means if the border extends 100 miles away from an international border or international airport, that leaves much of the country covered by those laws. I don't know if there's any legal precedent to, to border searches, meaning uh, close to international airports. Mainly they've been um, isolated to physical borders, but that is definitely a concern. 
excuse me, definitely a consideration to um, to travel with a burner device if at all possible. Or if you're going to travel with a device, at least remove or shred your information off of it before you go in case you're stopped and checked. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, not a question, but more of a comment. Sure. So what I've been getting mainly from all that you've been saying is the main point of security is to lessen your impact on, like, lessen your presence uh, digitally. Like, if you're trying, you're talking about border passes, like, just not border passes, boarding passes. Like, just get those in paper. You don't have to put them on your phone. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, that sort of extends from least privilege. If if you don't need it, you yourself don't need to to have a device, have an app, have a service running, have a anything with you. Uh, it's best to avoid it if at all possible. All right, thank you. Anyone else, or should I move on? I'll cover just some stuff that's in the chat. Uh, so. Pilot mentioned adding Faraday bags to the list. I think there was another comment a little bit further down. That not all Faraday bags are created equal. Most of them are created to shield against like EMP, not so much to isolate signals from going in or out. Uh, I think we even had someone do a presentation on that and show a couple bags that did work. And we tested and it did close all the signals out from the inside out, so the mobile carrier just didn't get through. Nice. Um, I made a comment that kind of off of the vein of your mention that pretty much anyone can monitor and collect data from any of your IT devices. They're always signaling, they're always beaconing. So anyone can choose to collect that data and what they want to do with that data is up to them. You're actually giving it to them for free. There's nothing private about it. But the, another area of security, I mean, you're going through the one, you know, I can't always have this thing off or I can't always have it not beaconing. You can, if you so choose, you know, we have a lot of creative people in this world, and some of those folks have decided to make it somewhat easier to have a device that can spawn, say, a thousand Wi-Fi access points, you know, just like that, and randomly start circulating them. Just or to get hits. Just to kind of make more noise okay. or to allow it to get more hits. But you can also do the reverse with those devices, typically. So I mentioned the D-Psych watch, really based off of Arduino where you could also do a bunch of clients. And so then those clients are going to seed out false connections. I mean, they're actually going to connect, but the device that's connecting is arbitrary. It's not going to exist for longer than probably 10 seconds. And there's going to be 10,000 of them, and then it's going to rotate and do another 10,000. And all you're really doing is, you know, kind of on the idea of using a physical pass or consolidating into what your traveling scope is, you're just trying to make yourself a smaller dot, you know, like a smaller target. Now, right. I work in the sim space. If someone were to do that and I was collecting said logs, I'd be like, well, that's at anomalous because that's not normal on the, the creating a whole bunch of nefarious or bogus sure. Wi-Fi clients. If it creates a big enough spike, then you might just draw attention. Just want to point that out. Good points, good points. I think that's our chat. Uh, one thing to, to mention about Pilot's com comment about Faraday bags, um, we like to think that when our devices are off, that they're really off, but that may not really be the case. The newest iPhones and the newest iOS warn you when you update that when you power that phone off, it's still able to connect to the Find My device network. So it's still beaconing out um, Bluetooth, or at least it's Bluetooth MAC address, so that other iOS devices in the area to find it. A foreign solution to a Faraday bag that I realized long, long ago when I worked in a cell phone store is if you have access to multiple ESD bags, these are the bags that memory sticks come in, hard drives come in these, um, computer parts, electronic components, things like that. If you layer say, five to 10 layers of those, yeah, it's bulky, but it may cost you nothing and that will effectively block um, cell phone signals. Now, I don't know about wireless or, or Bluetooth. Since there are similar um, spectrum being used, I don't see why not because of the, um, the type of material those ESD bags are using. So that could be the case. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, how much, how much are you willing to give up for that protection? If you're willing to 
to put your phone in an ESD bag throughout your entire trip, what's the point of bringing that phone? You might as well have brought a, a burner phone or none at all. Um, although these days it's really difficult to, to get around in the world without a phone. So you, you think about your own threat model like we talked about a few months ago and decide what privacy or what security you're willing to give up to at least be able to travel and, and get around. I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, our next subtopic, public transit. This is a funny picture. That's a real job in Japan. That's called a train pusher, where they have to jam people tight into a train to make them all fit. Good times. When using um, rideshare, a lot of these, um, not sorry, not rideshare, when using public transit, and I consider public transit to include buses, subways, uh, you could think of airlines as public transit, sort of. Uh, definitely ride shares are considered <coughs> public as well. Uh, all of these, even though I may not bring it up, I don't have it in my notes, uh, uh, situational awareness is key for everything you do and everywhere you, you walk through in, in life. Um, again, touching on the apps that we use, the rideshare apps. I remember a story back in the day, uh, I think it was dated around 2016 where the Uber app, and this is before Android and, um, and iOS cracked down on this, the Uber app could track your location five minutes after you stepped out of an Uber vehicle. That was a little troublesome for some people because they thought they were finished with the ride, they thought they were finished with the app, and they thought they were done with that transaction, and yet Uber wasn't quite finished with them. Um, falling into the wrong hands, that tracking location or that location tracking could have been used by uh, nefarious persons with evil intent. Um, these days, again, the apps can be uh, disabled to track when they're not in use. I kind of wonder if any researchers have, um, have really investigated whether that works. And you can disable background um, data so that the app isn't talking to the system when you have it closed, assuming that also works. I haven't personally proved that, um, proved the effectiveness of that. Um, in the lines of um, um, situational awareness, you've got to be aware of your surroundings, about your personal belongings, and um, being in crowds. One, one thing about the, the rideshare that always makes me cringe is when the driver opens their, their trunk or, or their lift gate, if they're driving an SUV, you're putting your luggage in there. How many drivers, after they, they close it up and before you've gotten into their vehicle, would stomp it and take off with your stuff in the back of their car. Maybe not too many, um, but I've heard of that situation being a possibility. It's really, really difficult to prevent that unless you have a carry-on size bag and you put it in the back seat with you. Which, um, if you do travel and if you can pack light and carry on, that's highly recommended. Um, there was an old TV show called The Real Hustle on the BBC. They talked a lot about these scams and frauds that, that people would commit and um, I picked up a lot of that and unfortunately it hasn't been um, it hasn't been on the air for a really long time so it's it's really difficult to um, to get a copy of that or, or to be able to watch um, those. but if you can if you can find a copy of um, the real hustle they go through a lot of th these things and I think they talk about um, these handoff scams with um, with taxis and such and once you're at your destination you're obviously going to need a rental car I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but, you know, that's not mine. <laughs> uh, at the rental counter, I've I noticed this happening time and time again, that people will lay out their, their IDs and their payment cards waiting for the agent to, to pick them up. So let's lay them on top of the counter. And there's often multiple lines on one counter. So you, you have your ID and your payment info sitting out there waiting for somebody to... Um, to read or to look over, they might see where you're from, um, they might see where you're headed if you're heading home. Uh, I doubt that it's possible to read the, the uh, credit card number off of a card and generally in this day and age since we who have credit cards and to a certain extent debit cards are somewhat immune to, to financial fraud if somebody were to lift that card number because the bank will immediately shut it down and, and, um, and reimburse any any losses, that's usually not a concern. But I think the ID cards could be a concern. So my suggestion would be to wait for the agent to, to ask for that card and hand it to them at that point rather than just laying it up 
on the counter and making them wait for it once they get it. Something about um, rental cars, not necessarily for, for security or privacy, but maybe for your own well-being is a quick walk around yeah. of that. For the July, July. Sorry, go ahead. Anyone has a question? All right, no problem. So fire up your, your cell phone and, and take a quick walk around video if you find any dings or scratches or dents. Uh, these will potentially inevitably come back to bite you when you, uh, when you return that car. And I kind of wonder if a car has had a dent and 10 people haven't noticed it, 10 different renters, how many different times was that rental company able to charge those 10 people that same fee for a dent or scratch or whatever? Uh, taking that video can, can certainly save you quite a bit of headache. Uh, when you are in the vehicle, check that the insurance and registration are in place. Uh, maybe even take a photo of that just in case something happens and, and you can't find it or something. If you're stopped um, by the police, and you need to show that that information. Having it on your phone could be could be helpful so you're not digging around in a glove box in a vehicle that you are unfamiliar with. Because the one thing that police will probably be very um, suspicious about is you digging around and potentially digging around for a weapon. Um, the basic checks, my my suggestion would be just to check the, the headlights and taillights if you can. Taillights are a tough one, especially if you're alone, if uh, if nobody is behind you. Sometimes you can back up against a wall and ensure that taillights are working. In most rental cars, they're going to have really solid backup cameras, so you can certainly see um, reflection of your taillights in those cameras. The, the reason for all that is to um, avoid unwanted attention, particularly from the police. If the police pull you over and everything is legit, it's fine. Uh, the worst that can happen is you'll lose a few minutes, but who knows who was in that vehicle before. If somebody was carrying some kind of drugs that, that would be considered illegal in the state that you're in, and the police have, have an itch to scratch and they want to bring out a, a canine dog to sniff around that vehicle, you might be driving a rental car that has had narcotics in it and they're going to bust you for it or at least make your life more difficult. And sometimes those stops uh, simply start with a broken headlight or a broken taillight, something that you can easily avoid. And if you spot this before you leave the, the rental car lot, then just let the agent know and they'll find you another vehicle and they'll probably pass on that vehicle that you spotted um, with a broken taillight or whatever to somebody else who is less knowledgeable or, or less um, detail-oriented and, and nobody's really the wiser, unfortunately. At least um, keep yourself out of that trouble. Um, if you've rented a car in the last 20 years, it probably has Bluetooth in the um, infotainment system. And if you've rented that car, there's a pretty good chance that somebody else's phone was connected to that Bluetooth and their information is still in there. Uh, I don't know why people still leave their information in. Maybe they are unfamiliar with how to delete it. Maybe they assume that the car rental place will delete their phone information from those um, infotainment systems. Unfortunately, they don't. They, they're just too busy. They don't really care. So if you're going to, um, to pair your device to, those, um, to the car, to the infotainment system, it may ask you if you want to, um, to sync your phone book with it. My answer is always no to that. And even if you don't sync your, um, your contact info, at least delete it from the car uh, when you return it. Give yourself a, a few extra minutes to do that because you might be struggling to figure it out. And oftentimes, if you're at a really busy airport, people are going to be pushing you to get that car turned in, get the keys and, and all that turned in and, and out of the way, and you be on your way while the attendant gets that car and, and takes it back to their cleaning site or or wherever just to keep it moving because those lines will not slow down for you. So you might need to pull over um, beforehand, even at a gas station, if you choose to fill up before returning it to an airport to, um, to delete your stuff from, from that system. Uh, know that the navigation also could store some of the information. Uh, a couple years ago, I rented a car and it had Wi-Fi built in. And I thought that was really funny how my phone saw this network constantly following me around. It was the same network. And I didn't know it until a few days in that it was actually the car um, transmitting a Wi-Fi into the um, into the vehicle for the, the passengers use. I don't think that's as much of a security concern as using public Wi-Fi in an aircraft or in an airport or, or public space because it's unlikely that many people are using it. The only issue I see with that is 
who's collecting data on you and your internet usage while you're in the vehicle? Is it really that much trouble to just use your own data connection on your phone rather than sync everything to the Wi-Fi in the car? Sure, it's convenient, but I suppose that there's a cost for that convenience. Um, last thought here about um, cell phone use. If you travel to certain states or certain cities, uh, there's a high potential that, um, uh, that there might be some restrictions for using cell phones in the vehicles. Quite honestly, I don't look closely enough at these, um, at these laws. And after having this presentation and after thinking about this for a minute, I, I think I want to personally start doing that as well. Just read up quickly on the, the place that I intend to be and determine if there are any um, cell phone regulations. Normally, I personally carry, and I didn't bring with me, a, um, a portable cell phone holder that clips into a, um, the, the AC vent for the vehicles. These are usually um, small enough to throw in a suitcase and, um, and easy to install and quite convenient in the vehicle because some, I'd say many vehicles, many rental cars, don't really have a convenient pocket for, um, for your phone, particularly when you're navigating or, or just trying to get around. Last one on the slide, I, I included this URL and QR code if you're on site. This was a, um, a story from uh, quite a few years ago where a guy had synced up a, a rental car, I think it was a Ford, to, um, to the Ford app, and he claimed to be the owner of that car. So he had full control of that car. He could start and stop the engine. He could lock and unlock it remotely five months after he rented it. Now, I could see a, a slight problem here that if I'm renting that car five months after this dude did, and he's locking and unlocking the doors or finding the location of that car or potentially starting the engine if that car happens to be in an enclosed space like a garage, that could lead to some bad news. I, I don't know of a, a countermeasure for this other than looking through the um, manual of the car and disabling its Wi-Fi connectivity or, or disabling that um, connectivity to the app in some way. Um, the end of that story, I think, ended in and much of a whimper that the rental company simply didn't care. They, they just said, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? We can't check every single car and every single user and every single app. And this is something that, that may make um, bigger news, especially if something goes really, really badly with, um, with these vehicle owner apps. I, I just certainly hope that we are all lucky enough that when we do rent a car that nobody else five months ago has linked that car to their app. I'll pause here for any questions. This is more a comment about the built-in Wi-Fi. The other thing to consider is that depending on the car, even if it's just kind of a luxury that the rental company gives you, um, a lot of times it is a subscription service, so that's just more information that you're feeding to these companies. Are you saying um, in exchange for your information, you get some free Wi-Fi? Yes. Nice. Nice. I suppose when you're, um, when, sorry, when you are the customer, I totally lost it. I, I think it was a, a comment about Facebook and, and social media where um, the user is really not the customer. It's the advertiser that's the customer. And when you're using that Wi-Fi, you are essentially the data feeding the customer and the customer being whoever owns it maybe. Um, so that's a great point. I never thought about that. And I figured that um, that the rental company was just doing it for the for the goodness of their customers because they're just kind. But I suppose that's not the case. Anyone else? He said it pulled over by police and you were paranoid like me. Turn your phone off and wipe the prints off the screen and using dust and they can predict your 46 uh, digit code. Can't legally ask you to unlock your phone uh, off in most US jurisdictions. I agree with all that. Um, the, the face unlock is nice on the iOS. Um, one, one clarification to, to his comment, and just to make sure everyone um, remote or here heard that, is that police can't ask you to unlock your phone. Actually, they can. They can ask you, but as an informed citizen, you need to know your rights and be able to say, no, you can't ask me, Mr. Officer or Mrs. Officer, that question because it's not in their legal purview to, to ask. But they certainly can ask, and you can certainly say no. 
They could also ask to search your vehicle, which I don't want to get into the to rabbit hole of that, but it's about legal issues and about legal rights as a citizen um, in, in the face of law enforcement. They can ask you to search your vehicle and you can politely decline that because they need a search warrant to search it. However, if they bring that canine around and it happens to be that rental car that somebody has smoked up before you got into it, then there's a potential that canine is going to alert and you've lost your right to say no because they don't have probable cause to search that vehicle. So it gets quite into a um, legal quagmire of things. And I, I suppose it's, I, I don't know where to begin to, to suggest where someone should um, educate themselves on that. Uh, there are some some interesting YouTube channels where um, where these guys go around, in my opinion, antagonistically go around, um, just poking at law enforcement, trying to get them to step over the their um, their their legal bounds to to make law enforcement ask for something or or request something that's completely not legal. Um, somewhat entertaining. I'm somewhat talking to to watch some of those videos, but they do make a really good point that that law enforcement does not have the legal right for everything. Any other questions? Just a note I put into the chat uh, <clears throat> a link to the EFF. It's, I think it's a little bit older of a issue from 2014, but it's still relevant. It's specific to know your rights, and it goes through a lot of these scenarios, specifically around law enforcement interaction and it comes to what they're authorized to be able to do, how to handle certain types of situations. I mean, it's definitely able you know, to talk about social engineering, which is an aspect of cybersecurity. Police officers are trained in a very specific type of social engineering. Like the entire scenario when you're interacting with law enforcement is one of those social scenarios where, you know, there's a set level of expectation of authority and compliance. So knowing your rights just gives you the ammo to know how to appropriately respond because a bad response could give them authority. That's the danger of those situations, of social interactions. I know it's kind of a privileged position, but it's kind of one of those things where if you can't afford it, maybe pay for some private like family legal consultation for an hour or two, get a business card, and that's something you can fall back on if, if you are in this position where it's like you're pulled over in a rental car and things are going south. You, you have a physical thing you can call. And, it, and I do recognize that's a privileged thing to be able to do. But if you can't afford it, I've done it. It's worth it for us. So. Thanks. I'd like to move on to, to make good time. So. Now that we've gotten our rental car and we've driven to the airport, sorry, not to the airport, we've made it to our hotel or, and Airbnb, and I'm going to use those um, interchangeably. I'm just going to call it hotel and, and door specifically. It can be an Airbnb, it can be somebody's private home, or it can be a fine establishment like the one that I'm presenting here. Um, that is not how the room looked after my kids are finished with it. Close, but... Um, this... This part of the, the talk is what prompted me to have this talk and an incident that uh, about the, um, the master keys that we'll get to shortly about false sense of security. I have personally, and, and this is heavy on opinion, I personally come to the realization that there is a, a massive false sense of security in, in these hotels and I don't blame them for that. I, I try to see all the angles of the story, but as you can imagine, the, the staff is busy. Uh, I sometimes joke with them that they're probably overstaffed and, and they have so many staff. Well, that's usually not the case. Um, there's frequent turnover and, um, and they have to train all the time. And, and there's often somebody new every week under training. And, and sometimes um, they're working some, some odd hours. And I don't, I've never had the conversation with a, um, a hotel uh, desk agent, just what their, what their shifts look like. But Obviously, it's it's not going to be fun because sometimes they're working nice, sometimes they're working day, sometimes they're they're working late or early or just crazy times. And and I get it. I, I empathize that they're going to be stressed out and that that they want to say to your face with a smile that your safety and your security is their number one concern. But I really doubt that's the case, especially after te I tell you the story about the situation that occurred. 
Uh, again, situational awareness is key here. When you check into a hotel, they're going to tell you, thank you, Mr. or Mrs. such and such, your room number is blah, blah, blah. And if somebody is standing over your shoulder or nearby and they see your Gucci bags and your, your real high-end stuff and they see your, your, your key fob for your Lamborghini, they're going to put some things together and realize you're either a high roller or, you just, um, or you're checking into that hotel room that you just saw a moment ago in that photo. And th there's a potential that that can happen and I doubt anybody really thinks about it. And, and I, I don't know if it's reasonable to ask the hotel staff, hey, don't, don't tell me my name, I already know it, and don't tell me my room number, I'll just read it off that card. Then you kind of look like you're a little paranoid if you behave that way, but I get it. That's just normal operating procedures, and if you are uncomfortable with the fact that a hotel might utter your room number and your name, maybe wait for the line to die down so that there's nobody around you. Uh, so that you're not um, among a crowd. Or being among a crowd might be better because there could be a lot of background noise and they may not hear you. Uh, so just having the, that physical situational awareness is good, especially when you're checking in, um, keeping a hold of your bags and keeping them close to you so that um, another guest or a passerby doesn't happen to swoop in and, and pick one up when you're not looking because you're busy focusing on the desk agent. Uh, Unlike airports, anyone can walk into any hotel. You don't necessarily have to be a guest to be there. Um, I won't tell you that story of when I walked into an embassy suite in, um, in where was it? San Francisco to pick up breakfast, but I wasn't staying there. And that was back in the day before I had ethics. So, uh, I, I think the, um, the legal uh, concern is, is no longer mine, but hey, it was a good breakfast. Anyway. Um, the hotel owner owns the property and they have rights to enter your room at any time. And you also have the right to a certain level of, of privacy. The problem is, unlike, say, airlines, airlines have really, really strict federally mandated rules that they have to follow. Um, I think it's called um, uh, contract of carriage. That's the, the word I'm thinking of, where, where these things are written and you know it and you can look up uh, these contracts on the airline websites. Unfortunately, hotels aren't really bound to that. And it's it's almost like a handshake agreement where you're just hopeful that they're handling their, their security well enough that you're going to be safe in their hotel. And they want to protect their property and their guests, obviously. Um, I think a, a big incident occurred in Las Vegas, the, the shooting, which caused a, um, a major increase in, in hotel security that, um, for example, if you had a do not disturb sign on your door for a certain number of days, they're going to come in. Uh, of course, they're going to, to knock and, and attempt to get your attention, but if you haven't opened a door and if you've had that, that tag on your door for a while, they're gonna come in and check out your room just to make sure nothing's suspicious. And I, I certainly don't doubt that that could happen at any location these days. Uh, when you check into a hotel, until recently, I didn't know this, but obviously they're going to store your registration info. I guess I did know that one. But I didn't know that they were going to share it, um, potentially with law enforcement or potentially with other groups. And that's probably part of the privacy policy, particularly the area of the policy that says um, share it with other, um, other agencies or other groups as necessary by law, something like that. Um, so unfortunately, we, we lose some, some control over the information that we share with the hotels. And I won't dwell on it for too long, but the apps will, of course, um, become essentially tracking devices. And sadly, the apps, well, for better or worse, I, I guess it's a, um, a certainly a convenience thing, but the apps now act as door keys. So you can open your door, unlock your door with an app rather than a physical key. So for better or worse, the protocol that's in use there and the fact that you're carrying your, your key around on a digital device being a little easier to, to lose, in my opinion, than a physical device might be concerning. So whenever I travel, I try to avoid using the app and I will um, suggest using a physical key rather than the app. Uh, moving on to um, some additional uh, thoughts about hotels and, and Airbnbs in general is um, something that's been in the news over a couple of years is uh, the fact that hidden cameras are being placed there. Uh, Airbnbs probably more so than hotels, but I suppose um, I should have written hidden 
surveillance devices rather than just cameras, because this can, of course, extend to audio surveillance as well. <clears throat> I personally do a, a quick sweep of the room just to make sure everything doesn't look out of place, make sure uh, strange covers aren't where they should be, make sure um, lights look pretty normal, make sure um, the vent louvers in the room don't look like they've been ripped off and then just kind of put back together real loose and, and just, just an overall view of the hotel. I don't want to call myself paranoid. Um, there's, there's a potential that somebody was surveilled in that room at one time and that stuff might be left over in there. Or you might yourself be um, a target of surveillance. Um, just uh, conjecture, I hear that this is a common thing in China, that they will set you up in a hotel room and put you in a specific spot because they want to know who you're talking to, what you're doing, what you're talking about, and, um, and use that as, as espionage or otherwise. Again, that's, that's my opinion and hasn't really happened to me or, or I haven't been able to, to prove it. Um, the evil made attack for those who don't know is the ability of um, housekeeping to come into your room and potentially mess with your electronic devices, potentially plant malware or, or change up the firmware on, on any system that you may have. Uh, the easy solution for that is to not leave your electronic devices in your room and we'll get to the pros and cons of doing that and or um, lock down the devices as, as well as you can. So if you are traveling with a laptop, ensure that it has a BIOS password on it, so it will ask for a password upon boot up. Ensure that when you leave that laptop in a room, don't put it in standby or hibernate, rather shut it down so that it's forced to go through the entire boot up process. Um, I don't know who will leave their phone in their room if they leave. Uh, I do travel with a tablet, so essentially that needs to be powered off as well, just so that, um, and it's an iOS device, an Apple device, so that when it comes up, it forces you for the numeric key pin rather than just the, the face ID. And we'll talk more about um, physical room protection and video recording, probably some of my more favorite parts of, of this talk and what I plan to do in my future travel after, um, after the incident, which, um, which I'll talk about some more. Some of the, the, the physical room protection is being able to barricade yourself in that door uh, if at all necessary. Since the room staff can get in, and since I had a master key, I feel that just about anybody can get into a room. And I think from now on when I travel, I'm going to have a device similar to what's on the screen or similar to what's in my hand, which is exactly what is on that screen. Whoever's in here is happy to, um, I'm happy to, to show all the goods here that I, um, that I purchased for my future travel, but this is one of them. It's a door wedge, and it works so much better than, than say, a wedge shape thing that you kick under a door. The issue with hotel room doors is the height will vary. So the little tiny wedges may fit one door, but not another. This one I like because it can really strongly uh, be wedged into the floor. And it has a um, kind of like a, a rubber surface on that tall surface and almost what feels like sandpaper or grip tape on the bottom. And it will really um, grab hold of that door really well. The bottom is made of aluminum, and I think it's fairly light and easy to, to travel with. Other options that I found, um, I'm not carrying one of these around, but it, it's something to think about when you're inside your room and trying to protect the door. This is a secondary method of protecting the door. There's no way that door is opening, uh, maybe not even more than a millimeter or two, unlike the, um, the chain that you'll find on the doors or like the, uh, the flip latch, which does allow the door to open a little bit. Uh, this, uh, this device along with that, um, with the, uh, Forget what the word. I think if you were to um, to search something like door jammer, I think that's the the search term you would find this product here, along with many many different variations of it. And they're not super expensive. Maybe twenty dollars for that. Maybe ten dollars for for this one. I did buy this product, which looks similar but works a little bit differently. And and it took me a while to, to study just how, how this thing would work. But I think what it's made to do is jam the deadbolt so that the deadbolt is so tight that if you're on a hotel room, they're often using electronic locks. The, the small motor inside that electronic lock is probably not going to be able to pull very much, um, very much if that deadbolt is jammed. So if you can install this on your door and, and tighten it down to the point where that deadbolt won't, um, won't release from the striker plate, 
that anybody on the outside trying to, to swipe a card, it, it simply won't be able to move the bolt because um, everything is, is so tight. Um, but of course, you're not going to be staying in your hotel room the whole time. You have to leave sometime, assuming. Uh, so some of the, the things that you can do if you can't take these things with you is, is hide. I have found some really interesting hiding places in hotel rooms. The last hotel room I stayed in, I left my laptop wedged on top of the microwave where, where the piece of furniture held the microwave. It had just enough space where an average adult couldn't see that angle and would not have seen where the laptop was, um, was sneakily placed. Another spot I found is um, above the plumbing near the sink. If you're comfortable leaving electronic devices that close to water, sometimes um, the plumbing is situated in such a way where you can just set it on top and few, in my opinion, few evildoers would, um, would look there. Um, and I stayed at one other place where under the, the sink there was some, some framing left exposed so I could easily just lay something on top of that framing but it's completely out of sight. Uh, so I'd suggest getting creative. I don't think putting a laptop or tablet underneath the mattress is very creative. I would think that that's probably one of the first places that an evildoer would go if they got into your room. Uh, my opinion on room safes is very low. Um, essentially, I can only imagine that, um, that hotel staff have to unlock those things all the time. And if, if you lock something in there and and obviously, if you forget that code, they're going to bail you out, then it's not very safe because who knows, somebody can go down to the front office, claim it's you because they overheard you checking in, they already know your name and your room number, and they can simply say, oh, I forgot my key in my room, my name is such and such, my room is such and such, the front desk guests, uh, front desk agent, since they're so busy and overworked, they don't even think twice to check your ID, so they're gonna give you a um, room key to that room and you just walk in there and if if you know how to bypass some of those safes which are physically not um, not very safe uh, they're going to be able to get into your stuff and they're also getting into your your door which um, we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, some i guess some of the higher service um, higher level chains uh, will will offer some kind of a concierge or uh, the front desk staff will be used to holding valuable things I would probably not expect a run-of-the-mill place like a Marriott Courtyard or, or such to, to have that kind of service. I don't think they even want to take the liability of holding your things. And that leads you to thinking about the pros and cons in your own um, threat model about whether you should take those valuables with you. I know in my own company, there's some, some travel guidelines, and it always says every single time, never leave valuables in your car in your rental car. If you have to, put them in the trunk, fine, but otherwise never leave them. Um, last time I traveled, I did, I did keep a tablet with me in the rental car and I found a really interesting hiding place for it under one of the mats. So obviously it's out of sight and if somebody even like rummaged around through the car, I don't think they would be able to look under a mat. That's just my, um, my sensibility to think like a criminal. If I were to, to look through a car for, for some quick um, grab and go kind of things, I probably wouldn't look under a mat for a nice tablet, but your mileage may vary. Um, the, I guess the last option would be bring your own security and that um, could be troublesome because, I don't know, I mean, safes are usually pretty easy to, to carry and, and you can have your own team of bodyguards, but, um, it's unlikely that, that you're going to be a high roller like, like um, um, others in this room who, who can hire their, their personal bodyguards and such. And Sorry, Eric, did you have something? I don't have a bodyguard, but some folks oh. have personal jets. Let's point that I, out. I realize that. And I figure if you have a personal jet, then you can haul around the safe. <laughs> and you have your own team of, of um, personal bodyguards. So, so on the, the last... What's that? That's right. I know everything. Uh, so on the last one, if we want to go back one, uh, so this one actually, it's one of those ways that you can tell if someone has been in your things without doing, you know, it's on the get creative side. And I learned this one from my father, who was a, a cop. And I don't know if this was a cop thing or this was just a him thing, probably just a him thing. But he could know if you, like, the bedroom, like that was an off-limits place. So as a kid, of course, you know, you always go to the places you're not supposed to go to, especially around, like, before Christmas time. Absolutely. So his tactic that I learned over the years was even just the lay of a carpet, 
you know, like when he left it, he would know, you know, like if it's one of the softer ones and he'll know mm -hmm. how it was when he left. Absolutely. Or a dresser drawer, have a specific angle popped out or have a small attribute. It could be a little handle on something. If you have it at a specific degree and you always leave it at that specific degree, well, then when you come back to it and it's not at that specific degree, then you know someone's been in here. So even if nothing's missing and nothing's been moved around, you can create your own tells. Um, if you look at it digitally, think of it like, uh, what is the, the trap? Or not the trap, the honeypot. So you're creating your own honeypot, but you're creating a honeypot in the physical space. So it's the same, if anything, it's the OG honeypot. Brilliant. I just want to bring that into there. And that can extend to taking a photo of the placement of everything in your room. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes in there, will they be diligent enough to put everything back exactly as they saw? Especially if you can pile some things up. If you put your laptop underneath something else, underneath something else, underneath something else, if it looks valuable and they're going to mess with it, will they be able to stack those things back up for you to be able to see if anybody got in there? I can't think of a way to, from the outside, arm your door to, to, allow, some, to allow yourself to know that somebody opened it. Tape. But perhaps, but then how will you know? Unless you know where you position the tape and it's so invisible that nobody yeah. else would know. But then what if it comes loose on its own because the, the door frame was dirty or the, the paint just didn't stick very well? There's a lot of variables. You're not damaging their, their space. Even with this door wedge, I'm not trying to damage the door. If somebody kicks the door in, they're going to damage the door because of something that I placed there, but I didn't cause that damage. So that, that's a great point um, about hotel policies. I'll, I'll get an, into a few more countermeasures, which I think are probably the only ones because you don't own the space and there's only one entry door and you have to arm it somehow as you leave. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but of course, you can always carry your own safe. Um, this is a, a tool that I discovered years ago. I don't have one. Um, if you've been in the information security field for a couple of years, particularly the physical security side of it, you've probably heard of an under-the-door tool. Uh, this is essentially a piece of wire that can be slipped under a door and then swung up to grab the handle of generally a hotel room and pull it down and open it. The reason why this works on every single hotel room in the United States is because of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Hotels are required to have a door with a handle like that, not a door knob. And it's quite easy to just grab this handle from the inside using a tool like this. And you can pretty much guess in every single hotel that you're ever going to stay in in the United States is going to be like this. And it's going to be susceptible to this. There is a great countermeasure that, I, and I, I scratched my head thinking, how can you defeat this? If, if the hotel, uh, unless the hotel does a few things, and I think I have some notes about this. But then I thought, there's already something in the room that will absolutely help you defeat that tool. And it's called a towel. It's, See, my mind went, I'm going to 3D print a thing, that, a sheet. That's, that's exactly what I thought. I'm like, I'm going to pack a 3D printed sheet yeah. that's going to be probably wrapped up in a towel just like that to make sure it doesn't break in my bag. Answer than what I was thinking. I was thinking, where to shove a bunch of paper into the door? Yes. You can get there. <laughs> now remember, if you if you're going to use a door wedge, yes, you can shove paper under there. But this will defeat that type of tool when you're gone. So when you leave your hotel room, you somewhat leave it vulnerable, and that you can leave in place when you leave. If you shove paper under the door, this wedge obviously won't work when you leave the hotel room. Uh, I think this is an incredibly brilliant idea. But a couple of other things that I I noticed that some some hotels do. I think I've stayed in one place where the handle on the door is vertical. I thought, this is the strangest place I've ever been in. Who would ever put a vertical door handle? At the time, I didn't realize that it could be very, very useful for this. And as Eric mentioned, um, and I've, I haven't i have seen this in, in person, but I think I've seen it on, on some YouTube video. Um, Deviant Olaf is a, um, and his last name is not spelled with an F, it's spelled with an M, but Deviant Olaf does a lot of physical security videos like this, and he gets really in deep about these type of tools and, and how to defeat 
um, how to defeat physical security. Really cool stuff. I highly recommend it. But he's shown a picture on one of those, um, one of his videos where there's a plastic, just a, a low cost plastic flange around the door handle that would prevent that um, under the door tool from reaching inside that, that door handle, yet it would still comply with the ADA requirements. Uh, I've never in my travel seen a, a plastic flange around the door, but I've of course seen the, the vertical door handle once. So when you leave your room, I, I thought, and I've heard about this um, over the years, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm, I'm going to on my next travels. There are two apps that I found and possibly a third that may work. These apps let you take a burner phone, something old that you can leave in the hotel room, and it essentially acts as a, um, like a blink camera if you have, or, or other home security camera that sends you a notification when, um, when there's been some motion. So you essentially set this camera up um, viewing the door, and if that door opens while you're gone, then it should send you a notification to your phone, assuming that you've connected that phone to the hotel Wi-Fi, whether you use VPN or not, that's up to you. But that, that hotel Wi-Fi allows that, um, that back channel communication so that you'll know either instantly or on a recording on that device um, whether that's worked. This app in particular is for both iOS and Android. Again, I haven't used it yet. I haven't tested just how well this works. And there's another app this one called Haven, which is only for um, Google Play Store. My apologies about some of these, um, some of the URL being clipped on the bottom. But if you look for Haven app, uh, yeah, that's, it's called Haven app, not My Haven. My Haven is different um, on the Android store, but Haven app does the same thing. This had some sort of ties back to um, Edward Snowden. I think he he worked with some group on on boosting up hotel room security because I think he was living out of hotels for a while and he needed to um, to increase his own operational security. So there's this app just for Android, but I think the reviews are pretty um, pretty rough on this. So if I'm going to try one, I'm going to try Alfred first and and see how well that works. But there's, go ahead, sorry. I pose a question to you. So that one definitely has roots in open source. You can just kind of tell. So quick Google here. Yeah, there's a GitHub project on it. Uh, I'm curious on the Alfred one because their website's a whole lot more polished. They have a little bit more of a business aesthetic to it. But yet I don't see anything for sale. So it always makes me wonder, like, you don't do anything in life for free unless it's, you know, like a purely, even open source projects can be monetized. But here I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, there's probably a hook in there somewhere where they're gaining something, kind of like the car with the Wi-Fi. So I just I'm curious about Alfred in that way. That's a great point. I'd like to answer that question. All I can say on the iOS App Store is I haven't downloaded it yet, but when you browse it, when you um, search for it, it says in-app purchases. So I know that there's a monetization feature of some sort. A lot of these apps um, offer a trial and either subscription or buy it after you've tried it. Okay. For you know, five bucks or hundred dollars a, a year or something hopefully something reasonable. I haven't dug into this, so I don't know about the cost of that. Since this um, Haven app was was um, Snowden-backed, I think it is open source, as you um, as you suggest, and there may not be a cost for it. And I, I don't know about the, the polishing of the back end or the app itself. Maybe because this is open source, and maybe because it isn't so polished, and maybe because the reviews are, are not the best, that this could very well be open source, and if you support open source projects, I highly request, um, I highly respect that, and, and go your own way. But at the end of the day, you might just need something that works. And if an open source um, option doesn't work, then then you got to move on to something. Uh, this last option, go ahead. Alfred one mentions advertising, so okay. they're at least partially supported by ad generation. It, it, it looks like there's an option to opt out of it but that's probably on my default. And that's, that's great that you looked into that. That could be the, the payment model. You view ads or you buy the license. Or you block your ads and not buy the license like I do. Thank you, Lockdown. Um, this project called Motion Eye is interesting. It runs on um, Raspberry Pis. And it is either an, an operating system image that you load the whole operating system onto a micro SD card which I recommend, or you can simply install the, um, the application itself, the binaries, onto an already running 
Raspberry Pi. And of course, this requires a camera. This could be an option, and I've used it in my, um, in my home for a while, but I noticed it was a little unstable, and this was about two or three years ago. Um, it was a little unstable, and I just couldn't sell my wife on, on using something that was kind of flaky and kind of finicky and, and required a reset every now and then. So unfortunately, we had to go to the dark side, but this is certainly um, an option. My only opinion on this is because it doesn't have, it uses a, um, a web-based portal, like a dashboard, to, to log in and, and change settings and, and view recordings. And it can push out notifications for motion to, say, an SMS number. And I think you can put it into a Google Drive or, or maybe an AWS bucket. I'm not sure how, how um, fancy it's gotten over the years. But I think the awkward part about this is when you join a hotel Wi-Fi network, then there's a possibility that um, uh, there's going to be a captive portal on that network. And you may not be able to interact with this thing unless you carry a monitor and keyboard to connect that uh, Raspberry Pi. So this is probably a third option, but it might require a little more hacks and a little more trickery. So any questions here? I'd like to quickly jump into the story of what happened to me a few weeks ago. And um, just a, a question about the clear like, what do you think about travel routers or um, sometimes they, they have uh, Wi Fi attached to them? I saw a Netgear one for about $500, it was with a uh, firewall and like 4G X wireless access. Do you have any experience with using those? I have a travel router that doesn't have 4G or 5G wireless, but it, it simply rebroadcasts a wireless network. I sadly notice most hotel rooms disable the Ethernet jack in the room. They assume everybody's just going to run wireless. So with the travel router like what I had, um, you could essentially plug it into a wire and then create your own small wireless LAN. Um, essentially, that's great for sharing a wireless network, and $500 sounds like a lot for, for a travel system that has um, wireless backhaul. Uh, again, if your threat model supports it, go for it. There's a, a product that I used. I forget the name of it. It might come back to me. It's it's more of an industrial ruggedized system. Port. Port, that's the one. And um, and those are rock solid. And they absolutely will will work really well. And they're, in my opinion, more reasonably priced than 500. They're about two or three, maybe four, depending on on the age and and the generation. Uh, they don't really include a, a robust firewall. They simply um, accept the wireless network and then just rebroadcast Wi-Fi. The thing is, most of us already have that in our phone. Uh, you can essentially tether your, all of your devices to your phone. It might be tricky if you're trying to share files between your devices um, because most of those tethered networks do not allow inter-device communication. Any other questions or should I move on? I would just say go on the cheap end, not the expensive end. Have it in your tribal right. wallet of stuff. You know, the device he's described and the one I travel with, like it's it's rinky dink, it's nothing special, but it can help you more with connectivity and access and less with security. That could still be helpful in a, a pinch. This kind of goes back to the legal aspect a little bit. If you're trying to share or stream from yourself um, to yourself, you might want to consider doing it through an intermediary like AWS or Azure mm -hmm. because um, if your devices get destroyed, whether that's accidental or accidental, um, then you have the, the server back up to it. Um, so yeah, that's, just sharing in between devices, you might always want to go through an intermediary for that reason. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you turn it off when you're not using it. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to jump into the story real quick because we need to clear out of this room in about 10 minutes. Um, actually, the library closes at 9, but our goal was to, to start cleaning it up in about 10 minutes. So what occurred was, and this is like story time, DC-864, story corner. The reason why I had this card and 40 to 50 of my closest hotel neighbors also had this card is because when I checked into this hotel, along with one colleague that I was traveling with, uh, their card programming system was down. So they offered to walk everybody up to their room uh, as, they, as they came in, if they needed to or whatever, to get back into their rooms. The immediate thing that I thought of is, are you gonna check everybody's ID? 
when you do that. And of course, going back to the busy staff and, and overworked um, front desk agents, you know, it's hard to tell whether they're going to um, ask for ID. I'm going to start digging a little deeper about whether hotels will honor that request to, to put it on your file, must ask for ID each time somebody asks for a key card. Um, I was in a really, really nice place um, in Austin, Texas a long time ago, and, and I said, hey, I forgot my, my key card. And they said, okay, what's your name, room? Here you go. Here's a new one. Didn't ask for ID, and, and I could have been anyone, so whatever. Uh, this, um, this hotel in particular, their card programming system was down, and this was Sunday when, when my colleague and I showed up. So I, I thought, fine, that's great. You know, we'll, we'll make do, and we'll talk to you guys each time we walk in. So that was fine and great. At 11.30, I'm dead asleep until the fire alarm goes off. And, and it's going off for a good five minutes or so. And I figure I need to be a good citizen and just leave that room because it's probably not the best idea for me to stay here. And I realize had I left that room or it, when I do leave that room, it's going to be a challenge to get back in because there's probably going to be 100, 100 other people trying to get back into their rooms. And it's, it's going to be tough. So I grab my ID so I can um, physically identify who I am that I'm in that room to the hotel agent. So all, all seemed good for me at the moment. And again, this is um, 11.30 p.m. Central Time, so 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And, and I'm not a night person, so I was quite, um, quite out of it and not, not sharp in the mind at all. So I, I walk down to the lobby. By the time I get down there, the fire alarm is stopped and the, the fire department is coming in. So they're checking out the scene and they're going through the building. It takes them minutes to, to finish that. Um, all is safe and they say everybody can go back to their rooms. So the, um, the desk agent starts walking large groups um, back, to, back to the room. She said, just head to your room and we'll open the door for you. So my colleague and I are on the third floor where across the hall from each other, but not exactly directly across from each other. We're sort of angled across. So I'm standing in front of his room, in front of somebody else's room, across from his room, not in front of my room. The, the desk agent first comes by, tries her um, employee key, exactly what you see here, and it doesn't open any door. It doesn't open the first two doors that she tries. Uh, mine and his were the first two. So she says, hold tight, I'll be right back. She comes back really fast within two or three minutes, and we're on the third floor. And when she comes back, she has a large stack of these cards, and they're in the envelopes that, that they normally give you. The envelopes don't have a room number written on them. They're just blank. Um, I can't imagine how, how many that stack is. Her hand is stretched out holding these things. I'm guessing 40, maybe 30. Um, there's probably at least 20 people standing in, in the third, third floor hallway waiting to get back into her rooms. She starts handing these out. And I quickly ask her, I'm not standing in front of my door. This is not my room. How do you know, how, how do you know that this key card you just gave me is going to open my door? And she says, don't worry about it. It's my At that moment, I knew what was happening. So I say to my colleague, hey, I'm gonna try to open your door. Can you try to open my door? We both open each other's doors. And then I can open my door and he can open his door with his key. So it wasn't like the, the first swipe of that key was, was a sticky type of, um, of um, connection where it would only open the first door that it opens. So we realized the gravity of the situation. I, in hindsight, regret stopping her from handing out any more of those the moment I realized that because of the time and because of my bleary-eyed, um, dull-brained moment that it was. So the next morning, I walked down to the, um, to the front desk and surprisingly, I got to sleep really quickly considering the, the massive security incident that just occurred. I walked down to the front desk and I asked him, hey, is your um, key card system fixed? He said, no, it should be fixed today. So knowing that the room was slightly compromised, I didn't leave anything valuable in there. Um, we leave and go to work. Come back that afternoon. And I say to the lady at the front desk, the same one who checked us in the, the night before, um, hey, is there a key card system fixed? And she says, yeah, we'll get you set up real quick, ready to go. So I take out this card that's on screen right now. I say, okay, well, we were given these cards last night. And she says, where did you get that? In, in the tone of voice that you would imagine somebody who is terrified and freaked out of the situation that they are 
they are now witnessing. I said, oh, the lady last night gave them to us uh, just after the fire alarm. She must have handed out maybe 50 of these or 40 or whatever. And she's just mortified at that moment. And I say, um, so this doesn't sound like a good situation. And she immediately jumps on the phone with her manager, who was not a very nice person to me particularly when I spoke to him on the phone. But I don't want to get into that one. Um, I speak to my colleague for a minute and I say, this place is completely compromised. I don't think we can stay here. I would not feel safe personally, and I would absolutely not feel safe if my family was here. Because now we have a known number of people who are potentially able to wander around and open every door. Um, she finished up her, her phone call with the manager, and she said, so this explains why we've gotten so many calls today about random people walking into other people's rooms. I said, yep, that's probably why you're getting those calls. Um, at that point, my colleague and I were already mentally prepared to pack up our things and go somewhere else. We brought up that fact that we said, we don't trust the security of this location anymore. We, we need to find other accommodations. What can you do? She gets back on the phone, um, sets us up with a uh, location nearby. That went really well. Um, packing up the rooms and unpacking rooms went really well. Um, until I had a phone call with the manager, the, who I thought was a general manager. It turns out, well, the, the story continues, and the rabbit hole goes so much deeper than this. Essentially, I tell him the story, what I just said here. And I think everyone in this room immediately captured the gravity of, of this situation about me holding this card, for one, and about 40 others holding this card. The manager says, oh, don't worry. They don't know that's a master key. And, and throughout all my story, it's like he was absolutely, totally nonchalant about the whole situation. He, he completely discounted the fact that his entire property's security is fully compromised. There's zero security in that place. Um, and not just guest rooms, but offices, private meeting rooms, um, potentially his, I'll just say it was a he, potentially his office, uh, potentially rooms that they store cash in. I don't know if hotels really store cash these days. Um, hotel rooms where they keep stacks of master keys, potentially, or rooms that, um, uh, that store customer information, which related to this, Marriott had another breach um, where somebody was able to, um, to social engineer a, um, a front desk agent to let them have access to their computer for six hours. Seems reasonable. So anyway, this, this manager guy was, was totally um, on the side of the hotel. They followed every um, protocol they had. And, and I more than once, multiple times, um, repeated the fact that where in your protocol is it okay to hand guests master keys? It'll open every room. He says, everything in the protocol was followed to a T. I don't see a problem with this. So he got aggravated with me and then decided to hang up. The story that is unrelated to this continues, and I'm still working through um, through Marriott's um, customer service. I got some really good contacts and a lot of understanding people. And everyone I've talked to, including I suppose everyone in this group, is fully understanding of the gravity of this, and he was not. And it's just really, um, really interesting how that's going to play out. the The moral of that story is I've realized that hotel security is um, unfortunately a a veil of of pretend. I can't I can't think of um, really strong words to say that when you travel, you are at the whims of hotels, and there's a really really good chance that they will follow what they think are good protocols, and they're not, or they make you think that you're secure, and you're probably really not. And unfortunately, it's up to us to be aware of these situations and. And that whole situation prompted me to do some investigating and, and to present this information to you and my thoughts and, and how to hope to, um, to keep others out of situations like this. If you do find yourself in a situation like this, I hope you promptly leave that hotel because there's a potential that your things could be compromised or your family could be compromised. And there's also potential that this is happening at more than one hotel right now this very minute and guests don't know it. So that's, that's the point of having your own physical security to lock down your own doors because you might be a victim of this without, um, without realizing it. Not a question. 
put a, an add on. It's like two weeks ago, me and wife vacation, hotel room, just imagine that. Uh, so there, the key card was an app, you know, because this is where you replace everything. So you push the button and it opens it up. And it was designed in such a way that I need to be standing outside the door. So it's got some near field, you know, goodness going on to make sure that I can't be out of the building and unlock that door. Now, me being, you know, like, oh, the, the door is right down this hallway. I'm going to get the app open. I'm going to put the phone in my hand. I'm nowhere near that door yet, but I'm going to get myself ready because I want to make sure I can hit that button when it's time. And I noticed that as I passed each door, that little icon that wasn't green became green, not green, green, not green. At every door. At every door. Could you open other doors? No, it was going to open my door. So the, their check to see if you were outside your door wasn't a check to see if you were outside your door. Was a check to see if you were outside of a one of their doors. So I could have been anywhere in there. I got into the room. My wife was like, did you hear the door click? I was like, yeah, that was me when I was down the hall. I had to open it again because it closed again by the time I, or it locked again by the time I got to it. So now I, my phone, of course, is not talking to any private resource inside that hotel. It's clearly talking to something, you know, in AWS or GCP or Azure. And then there is, you know, exchange going on there through their intranet back into that hotel to that door. So in reality, all you would really need is, you know, a hacker, nefarious or not, could open any door if they get into that right information system. And their one check to see if you're outside their door could be a pretty simple bypass because it wasn't really trying any type of unique IDs. There was nothing special about it. If anything, it's just an if-else statement, you know, if signal present, yes, if not, no. At least that's what it appeared to be. An excellent point, and if somebody wants to tackle it, potentially a great talk about the security of those apps and how how they can open doors and, and potentially even for residential use, uh, those type of proximity locks. So um, I'm, I've been gathering that. So the whole point of security is realizing that uh, not everyone is your friend. It's uh, it's more it's not paranoia. It's preparation. Yeah, good way to put it. A big but uh, before you jump in, a, a big part of the word paranoia is the common in my common people who may seem unaware or they don't care because they have nothing to hide and nothing to lose. They say. Uh, they're the ones who would call somebody who is aware paranoid simply because it's an easy label and an easy name. I, I don't let that slow me personally, but the paranoia, I think, is the common label. And the Black Sabbath album was pretty good. <laughs> Potential. A key area I always point out is anytime you're traveling, you're vulnerable, mostly because it's an opportunity. You know, like how statistically you look at data, I look at data. You're going to have more crimes, more types of theft. There's more opportunity to manipulate situations and take advantage of people, acquire possessions, whether digital or physical, while you're traveling. So it's while you're out of your home, you're out of your comfort zone, you could be in a different country, different city, different state. Attackers know that you're, you're going to be out of your comfort zone. There's going to be a moment of confusion, whether it's at the time of their attack or at the time after their attack, that's going to give them the opportunity to be able to get away. So just always keep that in mind. You know, like if I wanted to do a digital attack against personal in a more close proximity, of course I'm going to want a crowded place that's going to present me more targets. It's also going to give me more anonymity to Luke's point. Think like an attacker, think like a malicious actor, and it'll just help you raise your own self sense of awareness. Um, when you go into a third world country or a different country in general, look at what some of the, the types of techniques that happen, the, the type of... Um, you know, reports that come out from airports. I mean, I've been in some countries where we take pictures of the drivers and the cabs as we're getting into them and pictures of the cabs. They don't always like that, but that's one of those safety measures that they will sometimes have legitimate. You hop in that car, next thing you know, you're showing up to a house and you're being held for ransom. So that little photo you took could be that one piece of evidence that you could zip out and send out to someone in a last ditch effort to be able to save your life. So it's situation awareness. Is, is Snowden our hero? Like, should, should this portrait be up on every wall like Chairman Mao? 
I'm not a personal big fan of Snowden. I don't like everything he did. I don't hate everything he did. So I don't, I think my opinion is Snowden's kind of, I don't know if it's self-cast, but he's in that realm of being idolized on the privacy. I don't know how, okay, I'm indifferent yeah. on Snowden. I don't know if he's a hero or a traitor or both. Probably both, but you know. Too many angles to that story. Yeah, there is. One quick note about the um, traveling and disabling Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. On iOS, if you just swipe and use the control center to um, what looks like disabling Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, it's not actually disabling those radios, just kind of disconnecting from whatever devices you might be on. And you can often use another device to still see that there is still signaling. So you actually have to go into the settings app and toggle it off. Or you can do airplane mode. But um, a lot of people think that just hitting it on the control center, but that doesn't actually kill those radios. My understanding is that's also temporary. It only lasts for 12 or 24 hours. Yeah, the next morning at 5 a.m. it turns back on regardless of um, how you had it set before. Uh, slightly misleading. And in airplane mode, you can still turn other services back on, or you can have Bluetooth on. Or, yeah. So it's. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, man, that was awesome. Thank you, everyone. So we have the XPS coin here. Uh, yeah.